It's the next level. Hey, my name is Ross Marquon and I play Red Skull. You are listening to Panels to Pixels podcast. Check it out. Panelers, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this week we're covering Daredevil Season 3, Episodes 9 and 10. And the synopsis for Season 3, Episode 9, for the entitled name, Revelations, is called, and it states, Matt's already shaky world tilts when he learns a shocking truth. Karen runs for her life. Nadine discovers how Deep Fisk's influence runs. Yeah, and it was a bit vague in, in some aspects. Yeah, overall, episode nine, I, I thought was was really good and had a, a it did a great job. When we get to episode ten, I'm gonna have something to say before we start our our top fives. But this oh, one, you know, episode nine uh was really good. We got a lot of of uh reveals and obviously that's why it's called Revelations. Yeah. But uh it, it put together a lot of, of uh, a lot of pieces fit together that yeah. that we had kind of floating out there uh, prior to this. So it, it was it was nice. Episode nine did a good job of, of tying up some things and and uh, uh, was was really really good. I really enjoyed episode nine, and we'll get to episode ten in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I'm pretty sure this will go quick, but we try to take some time in what we're talking about on occasion because some things intrigue us. Yeah. Yeah. What was your overall impression of just episode nine by itself? I enjoyed it, but I seem to enjoyed 10 a lot better. I don't know mm. why. Maybe it's because of seeing somebody in a different light, but this just continued the story on and at the very end was a bit, what? <laughs> you know? So it, it's it's typical traits, but at least it, it kept my interest. That's the whole point was it kept my interest in the story and what was going on. We may be a little flip flopped on this then because I wasn't episode ten was not I mean there was a lot of good stuff in it, but we'll get when we get to that, I'll explain my reasons. But episode nine, like I said, I really I, I really enjoyed it. So Yeah, I thought it was good. So with that we should get on to our top fives. I'm Daredevil. So Steve, you should go first. Sure. Uh, just that beginning flashback with, with young Maggie and we get to see her and, and I heard her, I caught it on the second watch that she says, she specifically says, you know, three weeks from now, we won't be able, when they're all coming into the boxing match, her and the other novitiates, nov- novices, novices, whatever they call uh, nuns before they take their vows. Yeah. Uh, she says it's, you know, in three weeks, we can't, we won't be able to go anywhere anymore. And, you know, I, I loved how, how Jack kind of keyed in on her as being the, the person who wouldn't dose him with anything, you know? And so she's like, well, why did you pick me? And he's like, well, because you're the last person who's going to put something in my bottle. So I thought that was really, really cool. That whole idea of we've seen this before in TVs and movies where they fix fights by drugging somebody's bottle or something like that. And so he really didn't want to. And they don't really tell us how long it is between that initial meeting and then when they hook up and she gets pregnant. And then obviously there's another nine months there because then the baby is born and i loved how later in the episode when she's talking to karen she kind of says that you know people back then and i'm assuming it, you know it, it, we talked about this before matt looks like he's probably in like his mid-30s yeah so he was probably born like in the the 80s or so right would that be that would be That'd right be correct and, yeah you know and that they didn't really talk a lot about postpartum depression and stuff and so it really people didn't understand it and so now looking back on it she understands what her mood was and why she felt the way she did but she didn't then and she thought she had sinned and so the priests have to come and take her away and we get that whole interaction when matt is talking to 
his the vision of his father who says, well, maybe I promised her that I wouldn't ever say anything. And then, but after I died, she should have said something to you. And, and it's just really good. To, to, we got to have that background. And I said that in the last episode that we covered, I said, I want them to show us this. I don't want them to just tell me hmm. what happened. I want them to show us. And so I was really glad we got that flashback of showing us what happened. Yeah, definitely. And on top of that, you know, I think, the whole postpartum depression with Maggie was is that she had to go back and she was so strict within her beliefs that she was just stuck there. And by that time, she came to realization she didn't want to just throw this truth onto Matt and then have him upset. Then it, later on, it got to that point where it's a bit later and do I do this now? Yeah. Am I going to destroy this person? So it, it was a good way of giving us a whole backstory of what happened to Matt, why his mother was gone, and you know, we saw, uh, we already know what happened to his father and why his father passed away. My number five would be Matt's confrontation with the priest about his mother and pretty much getting the story from the priest about the truth of his mother and father, which would lead to your, you know, what you were talking about within the flashback. He was not happy with the priest. Uh, yeah. What was it, Father Paul? What's uh, his name completely escapes me right now. I think it was Father Paul. So, you know, he, he was not happy about it and not happy with the priest because their relationship was always based on truth. And Matt sees the priest hiding it from him as a mm -hmm. bad thing. Yeah. You know, that he was betrayed in some way. You know, he always thought, you know, going to the church would always, you know, be truthful to him. And, you know, it, it kind of, I don't think it stirred his faith, but it stirred his faith in, you know. The, the man, people. the priest himself. Yeah, the that's what, himself, you know, yeah. yeah. This has been the guy that he's come to his whole life, you know, that he's turned to when he's had problems. And to find out that his whole life, this guy's been lying to him. It's a shock. That is really, there's a funny moment in that scene in the bar when the the guy that he's playing pool against, that the father is playing pool against goes, what, you're a priest? What, are you hustling me, old man? Or something like that, you know? And, and the priest is like, just take your money and, and go. No, and, uh, yeah. yeah. So, but he was he was fixing to hustling because the first line he says is, well, that's 80 bucks unless you want to try again for double or nothing. You know, he's like, he's like taunting the guy to try to get more money out of him. And yeah. uh, uh so yeah that's that it's really a fun scene there which is funny too because you would think the guy would look at the way he's dressed it's only missing the little white part of yeah, exactly the, the little white inserts the only thing he's missing he's dressed all in black he's an older guy he's got the collar up and you know the only like you said the only thing missing is the little white tab in the middle so yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> very cool but i enjoyed that too was that all for your number five yeah that was it Okay, so my number four is just, we've been talking about this for the last several episodes. I've been asking this question, and we finally find out that it's the, that it is Nadim's boss who's working for Fisk. Of course, we found out there's a whole lot more people that are working for Fisk in, in this episode. Yeah. But it was really, really cool, that whole scene, because as soon as they walk into her dining room and I see all that plastic around, <laughs> yeah, you I'm think like, the murder's oh, going to happen. Yeah, yeah, I think of Lethal <laughs> Weapon 2, and you know, when the guy's like, I'm looking for the plastic that I'm stepping on, you know, and I'm yeah. like, somebody's getting shot. Somebody is not. One of the three of them are not walking out of this room. And so I thought that was that was really cool that I that I made that that catch. But it's not just that. You know, it, it still shocked me when the gunshot happens and when we find out who's the one. You know, he takes his gun out, he slides it across the table, and as soon as he slid it across the table, I was like, okay, it's one of them. I didn't know which one of them was going to pick up the gun, whether it was her or the other guy. But uh, so it, it still shocked me both times. And it, it really, what surprised me the most, though, about the whole scene was we find out that Fisk has been basically pulling the strings for a long time. What did she say? Fisk has been, has been on your radar for a year or something like that. And, and it goes all the way back to when his sister-in-law lost her medical coverage and he had to go into debt. And so we see that Fisk, and, and we see this more throughout the rest of this episode. And this is why I like this episode so much is because we finally get this confirmation that yeah. Fisk is definitely like this godfather type uh, kingpin, that he's got his hands in everything. He's got, he's, he's got hooks into 
into everybody just in case he's got to use them. And so I thought that was really, really cool. And it all happened, all this that we just discussed about in these first points, that all happens in the cold open, which is like 14 minutes long, which yeah. I love. I love long cold opens. I've, I've become the last few years, especially I've become a fan of these 15, 16, sometimes 20 minute cold opens that yeah. we, that we get <laughs> that I think is so cool that one third of the show is before the credits even roll. Yeah. And you know, a shame that we're not going to get this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, you you kind of picked your number four for my number three, so I'll just elaborate on that. The look on Hadim's face was priceless, though, when he finds out. He's yeah. He's got that shock horror look on his face, and he knows he's in deep at this point, and he has no way of controlling or doing anything about it. Yeah, and I, I thought that was really cool that we get this this whole idea, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a trope. In kind of TV shows where the guy, they describe him as he's the agent from the Office of, of Professional Responsibility, which is kind of like it's a TV and movie trope for the FBI that it's kind of like that's their internal affairs division is the OPR. Yeah. So I remember yeah. I remember on X-Files, they used to they used to say this all the time. They brought up this OPR yeah. all the time. And, and so I don't know if there's a real Office of Professional Responsibility in the FBI or not, but there's definitely one in TV universe. Yeah, they're just another form of infernal repairs. and <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Or, you know, human resources at that yeah, point. exactly, you know? exactly. So uh, I'll just go into my number four and you could just go into your number three. Sure. So my number four would be Sister Maggie helping out Karen to hide. It's her way to help Karen out and do something for Matt. Because Matt would appreciate it in, in the long run. But I think Sister Maggie was actually doing it for herself because she's just a caring person. And she wants to do the good based upon, you know, I, I guess she's in some sort of penance. This is her way of giving back. Well, yeah. And it's also just the fact of her helping out. Her helping Karen is going to help Matt. And the, the thing that I keyed in, and I've got this is in my notes for later, is that she played that scene really well when she realizes that Matt is gone and you just see the emotion on her voice, in her yeah. voice and, and, and everything, that it really shows that she liked, and this may be later, but I, I really thought it really tugged at my heartstrings that she liked being, she was finally able to be a mother to Matt. She was finally able to be part of Matt's life in some yeah. form. And I guess this actually is my number this actually is my number three is is just is that is is to piggyback on what you're saying about Sister Maggie helping Karen. It's we see early in the episode before she finds out that Matt has left, she's helping this this kid who's being taken to his foster parents or his adoptive parents or or whatever. And she's like, she's like, change is good. And he's like, no, it's not. And but <laughs> you see that she cares about them. But then when the priest tells her that Matt has figured it out and she runs to the room and she sees that he's gone. All his yeah. stuff is gone. And, and she, she just her eyes out. Oh, yeah. she just cries out. And I felt like at first it almost seemed hysterical, like a hysterical type thing. It was. But when, when I watched it the second time, I really could see the, the emotion. Yeah. The yeah. Pain and was there, definitely. Yeah. And that she really cared about finally this, these last, you know, few weeks or months where she's been taking care of Matt. She's been sewing up his wounds. She's been, you know, she's been uh, getting people to help him. She's been getting him to help people. She's been able to be a mother to him yeah. that she hasn't been able to be over these last 30, whatever, 20 years that he's been in the orphanage, you know? And so I really, I really, really liked that. And that was played really well. And I really hope we get to see a, a reconciliation between Matt and his mother before this yeah. season ends. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know if that's something they're going to leave, you know, for that would have been in the next season. I hope we get to see it, but I'm, I'm really... Part of me really thinks that we're probably not going to get to see this reconciliation, but that this would have been something down the road they might. Yeah, have done. same so. here. I, you know, listeners, I started to watch this. What it came out two years ago, mm -hmm. and I didn't really go back to it. I kind of, you know, got involved with other things and within podcasting, obviously, with the Walking Dead talk there. So I kind of put it on hold, and I figured I'd go back and with this. You know, new rewatch, as it were. I realized this is where I left off. The, before this episode is where I left off, and okay. you know, to me, this was like all new to me at this point. And same thing with episode ten. 
I was like, ooh, this is new. I don't remember this at all. Right. So with episode 10, to me, it was like more of a eye-opening thing. So yeah, it to me, yeah, it, it really hit hard on the heartstrings. You know, it tugged hard on there. Yeah. And to me, you know, that it was very well acted, you know, by, what's her name? Wally, Wally. Uh, Wally. Jo- yeah. Yeah. No, Joanne Wally. Yeah. Now you said Wally. Wally. I, I have always, I've always, my whole life I've said Whaley because I had some, uh, there was a family that was friends of ours in California that spelled their name the same way and they pronounced it Whaley. So I've always said Whaley, but you said Wally. So I'll go with Wally. I don't know. <laughs> uh, whichever. Yeah. Um. So we, we did your number four, your number three, because it kind of piggybacked on mine. Mm-hmm. Do you want me to go to my number two or do you want to go to your number two? Uh, You go to your number two and I'll go on. Okay, so my number two is just when Foggy's in there and he's having that, that his parents are all proud of him and they're telling him that this video is all over. And I think his his dad said, you're the star of a movie, you know, because he didn't realize that it's just a YouTube video. Yeah. Uh, but his brother kind of pulls him aside and tells him, hey, you need to you need to retract all your statements because I did something illegal. The business was in bad straits and this bank approached me and this financial guy and it's Fisk's financial guy. It's Fisk's yeah. bank that bailed them out and now they're kind of putting the squeeze on them. And again, it was just one of those things that I continued on that I realized that Kingpin has got his fingers in. You may, It makes you wonder how many other businesses on that street are the same way. They're just, oh, yeah. they're, they, that Fisk has got his hands in him somehow just in case if he ever needs him. Like, I'm sure when, what's, I just looked it up and I forgot it, the, the new, the new fixer's name. When he came to Foggy's brother, Theo, I think, or Thad, is it Theo or Thad? Whatever they, whatever his name is. Exactly. <laughs> they came to him. They, they didn't know that when they did all this, when they put this all in motion and, and, and brought the, got the, comp, got the, uh, the deli back on his feet, they didn't know that Foggy was going to, going to be doing this stuff yeah. with the DA. But they had it kind of in their back pocket, knowing that, well, if a family member of theirs ever does cross us, then we have this to fall back on. And so it's, it's one of the, it's just, it's just so brilliant. The, the way this show interwove those things together that I thought was really, really good. It could have been just good writing in a sense because we didn't really see Foggy's family seasons past. Right. And right. on top of that, that's their way of playing. All right, we have these characters to play with at this point. And especially when Foggy's brother tells him, no, dad signed those too. So he's yeah, involved as well. Yeah, we're all going to go to jail. It's not just going to be me. It's not just going to be, you know, mom. It's going to be mom, dad, and me. We're all going to go to jail if this happens because it's going to look like we all did this embezzlement. Exactly. You know, wh- wh- whatever it's bank fraud. I guess it would be technically it would be bank, bank fraud, fraud or, yeah. or whatever. And, and depending on the dollar amount, it's whether it's a felony or, or whatever. So, yeah. So he's he, – there. the whole family's in it. So it's going to be interesting to see how Foggy – gets gets his family kind of out of this if if they're able to to get rid of Fisk in a way that his family doesn't go down as well. Well, and my uh my first thought was is that the brother really didn't know what he was getting into until Oh no, I'm sure he later did. on. Yeah. And then then the yeah. guys came after him and then he had that look of fear in his face when he talked to Foggy about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Especially once once he figured out that what he was I mean, he knew what he was doing was criminal, I think. But, I don't think so. But he it, probably thought he was doing it for the best. He probably thought it was a okay. bit shady, but I don't think he was intentionally doing that. And Maybe. Consciously I, I, doing I see what you mean. Yeah, it kinda like kinda like tax evasion when people lie on their taxes all the time. Yeah. And they don't really think they're ever gonna get in trouble for it, but some people can. And then I the IRS comes down and then you got the yeah. big mobster coming after you. <laughs> yeah, I can see it. So what's your number two? My number two would be, uh, well, Fisk's setup for Matt and Nadim being used to get Matt there. But Nadim is so upset over all of this. Nadim is a really good man overall, I think. But, you know, he's just being manipulated within the FBI due to Fisk at this point. And he just, yeah. you, know, you could see it all over his face with every scene that he has to call Matt and do all these weird things. It, it's weird. Yeah, it was definitely, you could definitely see, and it's what we've been saying, what I've been saying all along. I'm really glad they didn't, they didn't make Nadim into a bad guy. You can definitely see he's kind of tortured about doing this stuff that he, he, he doesn't like it, but he realizes he's forced when he's in that elevator ride with his boss. Yeah. And he's like trying to ask her, you know, well, was it money? What was it? And then she says, no, they killed one of my children. 
Yes. You know, and he's got a re- and he suddenly realizes, whoa, this is a real <laughs> thing. This is not like, and she says, I divorced my husband to keep him safe. And I still have another, uh, you know, I still have my daughter. And I, and when I rewatched that scene the second time, I realized just how powerful that was because it was like Nadim suddenly realized that, okay, I have no choice here. Yeah. And that's you know, the very scene after that is when she says, you do everything Fisk tells you to do. And the very next scene is Fisk is making him, making Nadim take the ankle monitor off. Like the boss starts to go down to take the ankle monitor off. And Fisk is like, no, no. He's going to take my ankle monitor off because he's going to exert that power yeah. on him, you know. So uh, it's just really uh, – it's it's a – Yeah, this, it's like a smell the glove and kneel to the king kind of Yeah, exactly, attitude. exactly. Yeah. He's really good. My number one is just that cliffhanger ending that I, I was really glad we were, I was able to go into the next episode. But uh, when we talk about episode 10, I'm going to have some things to say about that. But just the, the idea that we realize that Matt went to the hotel. He didn't go to the restaurant. You know, uh, Nadim texts him the – I think you had this in your notes. Nadim texted him the address to the restaurant. And then the next scene, you can hear – like Matt pushes a button mm-hmm. on his phone and you can hear the text being read like by the phone oh the phone okay. voice kind of like when you go you know hey siri read my text <laughs> it, it, you know make sure my my phone just tried to turn on <laughs> no, I'm not going to unlock my iPhone first. Um, but that's, that, you know, Sorry, it's, the exact, <laughs> it's, it's the exact same. I just activated everybody's Siri. In the, um, but, you know, it's, uh, and, and so that's how he was able to, to get that. But he doesn't do it. And it, you get that little exchange between Dex and Nadim where Dex says, if you tipped him off, and Nadim's like, you were right there with me. You heard everything I said. You heard every conversation. There, I didn't do anything to tip him off. Yeah. You know, and he's just that smart. So I thought it was cool how he found Kingpin's kind of spy room. He felt the electricity in the <laughs> carpet. And then he goes in there and then he talks to Mrs. Shelby. And I didn't notice it until the second time I watched. But when she turns around in the chair, you can see that she's wearing the ankle monitor. So they they put it on her to make make the FBI think that that Fisk is still in the the, the area there. Yeah, yeah. 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 And they they Very hear slick. that. Yeah, and they hear that radio call where the dispatcher says that Karen Page has been located and for all the units to stay away. Yeah. And I, I but there's no they don't give us any indication of how they figured out where she was. Wow. And that's for me, that's what plays. That's one of the reasons why I have a criticism of episode 10. Well, you have to think that, you know, Fisk has uh, like every FBI agent in his hands at this point, and they could just check in and be like, here, here, sir. And give them but I'm saying she's hiding out in the church. I mean, the nun made that Maggie made it a point to say, we've been hiding people for 200 years, and they've been hiding Matt in this church for however long. And now all of a sudden, the FBI figures out that Karen Page is there. How? That's what I'm saying is there's no there's no connection as to how the police know that she's at that church. That is there's, true. There's no unless there's she no, had a tail from whatever she left Foggy's, you know, apart. Maybe that that's long. maybe they tailed her. Uh, well, think about it. She was open in front, right in front of Sister Maggie when she approached her. But the same. That's the same. Um, how would they even know to even? How did they don't even know that she's on the run yet? Like you see what I'm saying? Like it's not even like she's like she didn't remember. She confessed to Kingpin. Yeah. Okay, she did not confess to the FBI. The FBI know nothing about it. Yeah, so, but he so Kingpin the FBI. had to right. That's what I'm saying. Kingpin had to tell the FBI. Okay, she committed this crime, and then the FBI had to start looking for her. it. Just it's it just it's a disconnect for me, and it's a huge plot hole that really really bothers me. Okay, so <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your number one, right? Yeah. All right. Well, so your my number one. my number one would be you know that ending conference room meeting with fifth oh, wow, yeah. people he wants to pay into him as a, a protector and taking 20 in 20 percent whoops wait no he killed that one guy now it's 25 <laughs> yeah uh, to make an impact on those he is going to use then that ending you know obviously when matt finds out that there is a hit on karen and he's there and he's talking to that woman well you know it it, it you know because Karen didn't show up, you know, it, it's it's weird 
Uh. Yeah, well, and it's just it's that scene in the boardroom. Going back to that boardroom scene, it's it's very similar to you remember the scene in The Untouchables when Robert De Niro bashes that guy's yeah. head in with the baseball bat, and, and you see the blood kind of going out over the table. They do the same kind of thing here. Yeah. Dex throws that thing, whatever it is, that goes into that guy's throat. The blood is coming across the table, and, and Kingpin is just sitting there, and the woman's like, "Okay, where do we take the cash?" You know, because she suddenly realizes <laughs> yeah. if we argue, we're we're just gonna die. Yeah. So. So, so yeah, that that scene was really, really like I said, it's, and then you get the idea that, uh, that he wants to kill Karen, and then Matt, yeah, which is going to lead us into which also is like almost like a little callback to the way that the Joker entered in Dark Knight and yeah, very all similar, the other yeah, same kind of thing at that yeah. point, but in this case, this is more of like people that are legally taking things into their yeah. hands to, you know, but Fisk at this point is taking from them at you know, in his yeah. mind, but it's more of a mobster move. Yeah, you're right. So you had a you had a quote here. I didn't really have pull any quotes out of this episode. Well, the only one I got was Matt's father, the voice in his head when he's at the gym. I, I guess you know everything now, Matty. Matt's like everything I need to. Mm. It doesn't change a uh, a goddamn thing, <laughs> right? With with that thought, Matt is destined to do what he needs to, regardless of the consequences, it seems. Like, he actually states that, you know, I'm going to kill the Kingpin. I'm going to kill Fisk. Yeah, that's a that's a really, it's really cool how, and I had this in my notes, uh, very briefly in my notes, that whole, uh, there at the end where his father kind of morphs into Fisk. And then he's punching him and he yeah. breaks his neck. You know, I, for a minute, the first time I watched it for a minute, I wondered if somebody like if an actual person had wandered into the gym and he was, he, you know, like in his state, he thought he saw a kingpin and he was actually beating up like a hobo or something. I was, I was worried for, yeah, for a little here. bit about it, you know, yeah, it's um, not bad of it. And next thing you know, it's just some guy who smells. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, we had a couple of notes here of some things that we haven't already discussed. I think we both kind of have that scene there between Dex and Nadim. Yeah. When when he comes to – you're talking about when he comes to Nadim's house, right? Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. like so confrontational and so malicious. And it's just like it's in his face and it's like basically Dex spitting in his face at yeah. that point and with his family. And Dex is – uh, attitude and everything, and Nadim is looking at him, going, "You're talking to my kids. You're showing my kid how to throw what a curveball." Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and my wife's gonna make you eggs and bacon, and yeah, uh, and and he's got this look like I have to deal with you, and you murdered these people. You're you're the person that pretty much you know causes all this trouble. And yeah, working with Fisk. Yeah, and it's shot it's him too. Yeah, exactly. It's really it's really an intense scene there when with just everything that's going on. But I, I thought it was interesting. It, it kind of confused me a little bit, and at the same time, I was trying to go back. I went back and forth with it because he makes a point. The boss makes a point that oh, Fisk has been targeting you for a year. Dex makes a point that oh, Fisk wants you alive because of your your now your relationship with Daredevil. But we also know that Fisk has been has been manipulating this for a while. So I, I think it's just the fact that Fisk just wants as many FBI agents in his pocket as possible. Oh, definitely. You know, so that's it. it really was the only other note I had that we haven't already discussed is I, I thought it was kind of interesting that when they do and you have a little bit about this about that whole boardroom. When, yeah. when his, when the boss says it's another roundup and they go out and they're getting all the, they're bringing all those crime bosses together and they don't actually like it. It's at this point now, now that he's got, it's, it's almost like he's gotten a deem. Like Nadim was the last one that he needed. Once he got, yeah, he was the last piece of the, yeah. Puzzle. Once he got to deem. Okay. Now I've got complete control of this team of FBI agents that's around me. And now I'm just going to do whatever I want. So yeah. he rounds up the, these people, they don't arrest them. They take them to that restaurant. Yeah. So I thought that was really, really uh, kind of cool. Yeah. Same here. That, that was basically my notes. It, it just a look and shock and horror of Nadim when he sees the boardroom and how many people are there yeah. that are involved, and he didn't realize how deep it went. 
Yeah, and he says, like, he says something, he says one of the guy's name, and the guy just kind of looks down, and then he says Fisk, yeah. and they're all like, no, we don't use his name in this room, we use his code name, and that's, uh, I think that's the first time we've actually heard someone say Kingpin. I think they used it in the sense of describing him. Okay. When they, when they first arrested him and brought him to prison. Okay, maybe. But now he's taking and donning that name at that point. Yeah. Yeah, you're correct in saying that, you know, it's like he's stating, yes, I am the kingpin, and you need to call me this. Yeah. So I think that covers everything from episode nine. I think we've discussed yep. everything else there. So that leads mm -hmm. us to episode 10, which is entitled Karen. And the synopsis for this episode is hunted by Fisk and haunted by mistakes from her past. Karen seeks refuge at the church. Matt finally gets his shot and Dex goes in for the kill. So uh, really these two episodes almost could have been like meshed together and been, you know, like one big episode. One full episode. Yeah. For I, like two hours or an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. because it, it really like, this is the problem I had with this episode and, and I'll just get it out of the way at the beginning. Go ahead. Two thirds of the episode, the first time I watched it, the first two thirds of the episode, I'm going, why are we getting this now? Like, like this is, this is a, this is something we could have been shown like around episode five or episode six. Or even episode six of first season when he meets Karen. Yeah. Or, or, or you know? You know, anywhere in between. Why are they, why are we so late into season three? And I almost started to make a note that I was disappointed that they were doing this. But then the last third of the episode actually catches us up on what has happened and catches us up to the cliffhanger where we ended yeah. episode nine at. So I was okay with it. If we had had to separate these episodes, like we had done eight and nine and then 10 and 11, I think I would have been more disappointed because yeah. episode 10 not starting right at where left we left off. off. Yeah, yeah. We're going consecutive. Yeah. I think it's a good thing that we do things two episodes at a time with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so it, it like so that's that's my biggest problem with this episode is that really two thirds of it we could have gotten anywhere else in the season or in the series. We didn't have to get it here. Yeah. And it just felt a little late in the season. I mean, as much as I, I like getting Karen's backstory, I like seeing what happened with her family. I like, I like seeing all that. I, I, I enjoyed the storytelling aspect of it. It was just the placement of it was a little weird. To what me. would you actually so. rate the actual episodes? Like one out of one to five out of, uh, Daredevil kicks. <laughs> For, for this episode, I would probably have gone like about a four, maybe. Really? That high? It would be, it, it would be, well, oh, you've got to understand if I go below an eight, why am I watching I'm, this I'm show? I'm talking one out of five. You... One out, oh, sorry, one out of five. Okay, if I go below, if I go below a four yeah. in a show, I'm asking, why am I watching this show? If it's like a three or, or three and a half, I'm like, why am I still watching this show? Yeah. So that's, that's where my, I do the same thing with a 10 point scale. If it falls below eight, then I'm starting to question why I'm still watching the show. <laughs> so for me, I know that's not everybody has that scale, but no, that's kind of my scale. It's got to be a B. You got to be a B or above for me to really lock in and and keep my interest. If it if it falls below a B, you're getting close to me being out. I'm, so. I'm curious of what it's going to be like for Fear of the Walking Dead when it comes out. This year. <laughs> See, I you know I liked Fear of the Walking Dead. I didn't have as many issues with it as as other people. Did there was enough stuff in it? I think I think I had a couple of ratings on on Fear the Walking Dead talk through that dropped that dropped below an eight. Yeah, but I think the the worst I did was like a seven point nine or yeah, seven point yeah, eight, you were just maybe a, hovering around an eight. I, I yeah, think it I, had to do with the fact, just like me, you were entertained based upon certain characters, but exactly, it was just the writing that was terrible on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If it starts, to, like I said, if it starts to drop too much below an eight or below a four for me, so like I said, if I was giving this episode a rating because that last third is so good, yeah. and I did like the story, I just was it was the placement of the story that that bothered me. Yeah, yeah. To you me, know, so I would still give it around a four. I would probably give it around like. You know, three point nine, and I'm okay. not saying it's bad, but mm -hmm. you know, in a sense that it kind of took away, but they could have done it quicker with not being, you know, three quarters of the actual episode. Right. Right. So, I, like I said, these two episodes almost could have been one big episode. Yeah, definitely. So, I guess we should get into our top five. 
I'm Daredevil. Sure. Why don't you start? Uh, my number five would be seeing Karen in her life before. <laughs> Obviously, before she met Matt and Foggy. The scenes of her while she was in her hometown with her family and their business. So we got a little backstory on that, and I enjoyed that. She had a brother. She had her father. We find out her mother died of cancer, but she also left, apparently. So, and her dealing and using drugs at a certain point with her boyfriend <laughs> at that time. The things she did... Her involvement with her family overall, you know, you know, you could tell she loves and cares for them, both her brother and her father. But there was all she was at that point of I need to get away. Uh, but she did generally, you know, she genuinely came from a good family. So the whole story of Karen came out within this episode, something like we just spoke about. You know, honestly, I would have preferred to see this within the first season when they first encountered Karen, you know, Foggy and Matt, but we didn't get that. And I think they realized, oh, wait, we, there's something about Karen that we should bring up. Let's do something that, you know, centralizes around Karen. But I, I think it's a little bit too late for that. But it, it was enjoyable nonetheless, because we actually got to see a little bit more. Yeah, this was my number five as well. Just whole party girl, Karen kind of thing. Yeah. We see her kissing another girl. She's doing drugs. She's dealing drugs. It, it, it gave me a little bit of a shock, but at the same time, I, I was really, I was impressed by it. And like I said, I'm, I'm with you. I, I like that we got this story. I just wish we, it didn't have to be right here. Yeah. I had thought her brother's death, this is how long it's been since I watched season one and two. I had thought her brother's death had occurred in season one. I didn't realize that it that it hadn't been on screen that we hadn't seen it yeah. already because Fisk had all you know it talked like he had information about it and it just shows another aspect of Fisk where he's dug into these people's lives that are involved with Daredevil that are involved with him and he's dug so deep that he knows what happened with her brother he knows that that cop covered it up yeah. he knows the the real truth and it also explains why her father was so cold to her there uh, a couple episodes ago when she called and wanted to come home and he was just like no you know so it seems like this has been less than 10 years i don't know how young karen is at this point but it can't have been too long ago no i would this, say within she, the years that she met up with matt you know where her matt and foggy Right, just Matt. like a couple of years before, because she went back. I'm going to disagree with you on one point. She didn't want to leave, remember? She didn't. No, she, didn't. she wanted to stay. It was her brother under. And this is my next point, so yeah, I don't want to get too much to into get it. out of the town. Yeah, I know. But yeah, yeah. So it really wasn't. But then once she did leave, it seems like she kind of cut everything off. And so she finished Georgetown, then became a reporter, came back, and then came to New York. And so however many years have occurred in between there before, and then she meets up Matt and Foggy. So, and does the whole thing with the Punisher as well. And so, you know, we, we, it's a different, it, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I, it's a different, it's a completely different side of Karen that we've not seen. Before. Yeah. So what is your number four? Well, that scene after Karen and her boyfriend coking it up and drinking whiskey, the boyfriend beats her brother so bad, and then she uses the gun to stop Todd, you know, her boyfriend. Todd's motorhome is on fire. <laughs> that was just so intense. You know, honestly, to see Karen just doing what she can for her brother, but upset, you know, altogether, you know, it's it just then the accident. That accident, the scenes were so intense. Her brother dead and her father upset. Apparently, the sheriff knew something because, obviously, he knows Karen's antics. Because when she had the blood dripping from her nose into his eggs. Oh, yeah. As soon as he showed up at the accident, I'm sure her eyes were probably all pinned out. And you could probably tell she was high and drunk. You know, and she'd been driving. So, yeah, yeah completely. I mean, you could probably... I'm sure they're pretty good at recognizing when someone is is under drunk or yeah. high yeah. and under yeah under the influence so i'm sure as soon as he showed up on that accident scene he knew exactly what what had happened yeah and he knew what and was the going brother on. was obviously yeah in the restaurant yeah. too yeah and he was and the brother was incapacitated he wasn't able to drive because he was just been beaten up so badly yeah. so uh, so yeah and it was that that accident and they filmed it really well i wonder if that was a practical 
effect or if they did some sort of CG with that with that car because it really looked like it was a practical yeah. it looked like it was a, an actual practical effect with the car flying up in the air and flipping over yeah it definitely looked like that to me the stunt like it was a real stunt so my number four is uh, just we we started to talk about it a little bit but already it's just Karen's brother undeferring her from college and explaining that that oh Georgetown you can only defer twice or you have to reapply and then that whole that whole dinner scene that they have there yeah. where the the dad is trying to kind of pull them together and he's trying to say that that he can make it you know but she's like no you guys this place would go under you just try to buy this grill i do the books i set everything up and she's really i wonder how truthful what she's saying is because if she has been so, you know, on drugs and drinking and staying out late and getting in, in, has she really been taking care of the business solely? No. I mean, on I one hand, so. I, want- I think the, the father was really involved and so is the brother. I think she just took care of a portion of it. And that's the end. And, but yet just in that same hyper kind of paranoid uh, yeah. addicts yeah, and, and kind of addict attitude. She thought, no, I'm carrying everything on my back. And I got a little bit confused about the mother because she says something to the, to the father in the effect of like, well, you're, you're keeping this place as if mom is going to come back. And then the dad says, well, if she does come back, you're not going to be here because you're going to college. So for a moment there, I was really confused whether the the mother had just left or if she had died. But then of course we get at the end or towards the end of that, the the whole flashback scene, we get the father saying, you know, I'm glad your mother's not alive to see this, you know, and Karen say, saying that, no, she lost again. She's never. So we realize that the mother did die from cancer, but there's a, it's a very, it's a very confusing scene both times. It was kind of that I watched it. Yeah. And on top of that, her throwing the picture frame down with the scratch, off on it that her mother eventually you know you Mm. you always used to use but that was the last one she purchased and yeah yeah she's not a winner but she wanted to have all this money if she did win to get away oh uh, heartbreaking just like that last and you can see you can see her dad how how just upset her dad was oh yeah at her doing that and that's again that's one of those things where that's why i was kind of confused about why there was so much sentimental value on this lottery ticket, you know, but I, I get it. It was the last thing she bought before she passed away. So, so where are we at? You're number three. Yes. Yes. Apparently I don't have one. No, no, I do. Okay. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fisk's target on Karen with bullseye. Well, Dex, obviously Dex is sent on his mission from Fisk. So yeah. to see how Dex is played out in this is wild. Yeah, the end. that's another one of those moments where when – it was interesting that when, when Kingpin mentions James Wesley, that he's he seems surprised that Dex knows who that is. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't he not forget what Dex was an FBI agent. He was reading your files. He knows what's going on. And so it, it kind of surprised me that Kingpin – didn't think he knew about Wesley because, but then you could definitely see the emotion. Uh, and again, Vincent D'Onofrio just plays it so well. You can see the emotion on him when Dex says, well, he disappeared, right? Because, you know, the official story is that he disappeared. And then Kingpin comes out and goes, no, he was murdered and Karen Page murdered him. And then all of a sudden, now you start to see things kind of falling into place and that and suddenly Dex understands why Kingpin or wants her dead and he says, you know, just give me the order. I thought that was interesting too, that he specifically told he wanted Wilson Fisk to say the words. He wasn't just gonna assume that he wanted Karen dead. He wanted he needed him to say the words. I want you to kill Karen Page. Yeah, because it's like, hey, just give me the go ahead. Right, exactly. Like you you got to give me, you got to give me the for sure because he already knows. Well, you sent me, you know, he says you, I sent you into the bulletin to embarrass her before I knew what she had done, and now I want you to kill her. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of like, yeah, let me off my leash and I can do what I need. Exactly, to exactly. You. And maybe I'll get a biscuit or something. <laughs> uh, my my number three is uh, it's it's pretty short, but it's it's uh, just I thought it was really really cool, and it shows how how much Matt still cares for Karen and Foggy as well. Well, we know that he cares for Foggy, but it sh- it shows how much he cares for Karen 
in that he abandons his plan to kill Wilson Fisk to go save her. And yes. because Mrs. Shelby tells him, you know, if you leave here, I'm going to have to tell them that you were here and then they're just going to triple security. It's going to be even harder for you again next time. So you should really stay so that you can kill Kingpin. I mean, she didn't say that, but that's what she was implying. And he's yeah. like, no, you do what you got to do. I'm going to go. And so I thought that was really, really cool. And the fact that he kind of, it's, it's kind of a deus ex machina kind of thing where he gets there right, right in the nick of time to, to, <laughs> to stop uh, Dex from killing her. But still, it was really, it was really good to see him have that, know that he still cares for her. Oh, definitely. And you knew that that was, that was going to come. Come on. <laughs> that would bring me to my number three. Your number two. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't count. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> They're not really numbers. They just we just throw them in there. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, that would be the church scene. You know that encounter really bothered me. You have Dex coming after Karen. He interrupts the sermon to come after her. You know, basically a devil in a house of worship because he's wearing the daredevil. Wow, suit. I didn't even put that together. And the and you know the the priest was just saying to them how proud he was that they were willing to come out even though this threat was over Hell's Kitchen. That's really good, Mark. Yeah, and then then he kills Paul the priest oh. that helped Matt all that time. <sighs> I was crying during this scene. I was a little upset. And I, you know. I had this in my notes. I don't I don't think he meant to kill the priest. I think the priest jumped in front of Yeah, he got in the way. Yeah, and, and yeah. he meant to kill Karen. So yeah. um but that leads right to my number two, two. which is I still want to know how they knew Karen was in the church. <laughs> sorry, I hope that didn't just mess up the recording. But I, eh, somebody needs to explain. I, I, I need an explanation. I need them to give me something, even if it's just throw me a bone. As it's just like you said, oh, somebody was tailing her, or we, <laughs> whatever. Give me a bone in the next in the next episode to tell me why you knew she was at that church because. I'm this is a this is a plot hole that's really going to bother me and I don't usually let plot holes bother me but this one for some reason I just cuz there's been I don't remember the specific examples but there, there's been two or three things in this season where something has happened and you have no idea what the catalyst was of how well, yeah. wait wait how did why did that happen why why did they know this why you know kind of like how did how did Kingpin know that Potter made the Daredevil suit you know, yeah. those kind of plot holes that just, I, I'm going to dismiss most of them, but this one, I am going to pull at this one because this one really, really bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. You got that. I got that on my system. I'm done with that. <laughs> what is your number one? Well, the fight at the end with Matt and Dex, that was an interesting fight. You know, it, it was like, you could see it was almost like a dance at one point. But Karen was there, and she cares and loves Matt. She is there holding him like Father Paul within the first season at the end. If you think about it. Yeah. She doesn't want him to die. Neither do I, because the Dex, you know, Dex made the devil of Hell's Kitchen a real devil at this point by putting on his costume and portraying the daredevil in the wrong light. So now everybody's got this uh, thought of daredevil as being... A bad guy. Not yeah, they don't. A bad yeah. guy. Not a vigilante, but somebody who's doing purposely all these things. Yeah. My number one is uh, is Karen willing to sacrifice herself to save the, the other people in the church. She comes out of hiding when Dex is there, when he starts hurting people, and then she distracts him so that they can run out of the church. And then of, of course, we've already talked about the fact that the, the priest sacrifices himself to save her. And I, I loved that when I think it's in the, it was in the last episode when you hear Jack say something about the Muay Thai ropes that he's wrapped around his hands and, and wrists. And he says, well, I've got to inflict more damage, but I love that he wasn't just using them to inflict damage. He was also using them to like deflect the things yes, that he was that, using to protect himself. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that that was really really cool. Again, that's part of the fight that you were talking about. Just but just seeing all the different people that were willing to sacrifice themselves for others in this in this episode was was really was really cool. I think go ahead and give your quotes because my I have no quotes and I think all of my notes have been covered. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to skip over the first one. I'll just do the last two. Okay. 
Paul the priest says, the end is not the end. John said that. <laughs> Come to Mass. And that was to Karen, giving faith when one loses it. It's always a good thing, in my opinion. Yeah. My last one would be, Matt, do what you have to do to the lady at the monitors for Fisk. Matt was ready to do what he needed to do for his friend at this point. So he was just like giving her the cue of like, do what you need to do. You yeah, I, I love that. I love that. So like I said, I think all my notes were covered except for the fact that, oh, the, the only one that we haven't already discussed was that Nadim was the one that drove Dex Devil to the church. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, the only note I have would, you know, I kind of take this thing kind of a little bit personally when I watch certain things like this. It kind of touches me because in this episode, it was hard for me to watch. In all honesty, I, I've had friends that I have. You know, that have gone through a lot with drugs and issues and trying to reconcile and come back and stuff like that. It, it was like someone showing me their story in their town like they did with Karen. So that that's what really was hard to watch. But it was some one of those things that I guess they needed to show. The thing in the church was something that I was not comfortable with either when, you know, Dex is there in daredevil garb and, you know, like I said before, you know, the devil in the house yeah. of worship, you know, and mm. portraying daredevil that way. It, that was a bit hard to watch, but yeah. honestly, that's what the comic did at certain points too. So there it is. <laughs> so we we had some uh, listener feedback. I, I want to apologize. I didn't pull the direct quote out because I, I did, wasn't able to dig dig through and find it. But a big thank you to to Laura, our, our good friend Laura, who helped us out by explaining about the rabbit in a snowstorm painting that we talked about. Uh, that's going back to episode seven, I think, that we talked about. Th that I was like, why do they mention this painting? And then we never we never hear anything more. About about it, and she explained uh, to us in a Facebook post that this was a painting that Vanessa and Fisk had bonded over back in season one, and so that's that's the significance of it and why he's so attached to it. And uh, from the looks of, I think I read the synopsis for the next episode. I think we're going to get some more about this painting as well. Yeah, definitely. So basically, I'm still enjoying the show. I'm loving finally getting to watch this at this point, you know, I'm at start point, a new start yeah. point uh, with the this particular season. So, if Charlie <sighs> talks, actually if I do see him, I'll be like, "Sorry, I didn't watch it." <laughs> I'm thing I'm really enjoying good. it. I, I I'm liking it. I'm glad we're doing it. I think I hate to to even give this kind of criticism cuz mm -hmm. I I do enjoy watching it, but if I had never watched season 3, I wouldn't be upset. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that, I know. You know, I know. Knowing that it's over and knowing, I mean, I'm glad we're doing it, but at the same time, if I had never watched season three, I don't think I would have ever missed it. I would have never been, I would have, like years from now, I wouldn't go back and go, oh, I need to rewatch Daredevil, particular, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> because I had totally forgot about it. And once, you know, once we got through season two, we had the Punisher. And then when we, when we covered the Punisher on this podcast, there never, there really wasn't any need to go back to Daredevil. So I, I I'm liking that we're doing it, and, and I'm I'm glad, but at the same time, nah, if we hadn't, yeah. I'd be okay with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are certain movies that it's like, yeah, I didn't need to see that one. Yeah. Like, Ang Lee's Incredible Hulk, I didn't need to see that before I needed to see Incredible <laughs> Hulk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that the one with Jennifer Connelly, though? It had Jennifer Connelly in it, or is that the Liv Tyler one? Uh, Liv Tyler was the Incredible Hulk with Edward Norton. Okay, so that was Ge the Jennifer Connelly one. Yeah, so, Ang Lee. So at least you had Jennifer Connelly in it, you know, you got that yeah, going yeah, for that's it. True. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, had a little bit in for, for me, uh, from comic talk news is that I've been reading the lock and key comics. They go back about 10 or 10 or 13. I think they're 2007, 2008, something like that. I've been reading those comics on, uh, comiXology because Netflix is doing the TV series now and strange indeed podcast is following it. So it's an enjoyable read. I'm going to say here something similar to what I said in a voicemail that is strange indeed that, um, well, I was, I was never a big Stephen King fan. I read a couple of his books in the eighties and, and I'm okay with it. I can definitely see the Stephen King influence in the lock and key comic. So I'm kind of glad they've toned it down a little bit for the TV series, but the TV series is still really, really good. Oh, that's pretty cool. But I also understand why people, if you're a huge fan of the comic, I can understand why you might not be a fan of. Jeff. The show, yeah, because they did tone down a lot of the brutality and uh, the crudeness of the comic, and hmm. that's my opinion. 
That's interesting. Yeah. So for those of you who actually watched the show and never read the comic, this would be coming from Steve. Yeah, just be aware if you if you really enjoy the show, I would recommend the comic, but just be aware that the comic is like I would put it this way, the comic is like an R-rated version of the show. Oh wow. So if you think of the show as like PG-13, TV-14 kind of stuff, which is maybe a little bit more than that, think of the comic as like the uncut version. So, or the director's cut version is the comp. Yeah, like Preacher. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, we have a little bit of comic talk that I've got some information to about. And that would be uh, the Batman is coming out in a year or so. Uh, that was with uh, Robert Pattinson. And they have an image now that's out that leaked out of the Batmobile now. So very much like a muscle car from like the 70s and 80s. I think it looks good because, like, I'm a fan of that those kind of cars, but that's just me. I like the images I saw. The, the first images that came out were so vague, I couldn't tell that's what it was. But then most recently, the screen capture that I think that you posted to our Facebook page showed it really clearly. And I definitely like the muscle cars of, like, the 70s and the 80s. So yeah, it looks really like cool it's, to it's me. It's a different take, but, you know, like, the deep down fan of me. <laughs> would love to and prefer the 89 Batmobile from Michael Keaton to be there. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was good. And I like the tank version from the Dark Knight movie series. But The Tumblr? Yeah. The Tumblr, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a little bit other news that came in this week. Uh, Andrew Garfield has apparently had some sort of negotiation with uh, Sony for uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse live action. This was leaked, but whether it's rumor or not, I'm not sure. But I'm pretty sure he went into Sony for something. And I'm pretty sure that came up because there's a lot going on regarding that. The only th- one missing key would be Tobey Maguire now. Uh, I, I hope this goes through that way. You know, we get an actual live action into the Spider-Verse, plus we would get Miles Morales, and we don't have to rely on Tom Harding. Uh, not Tom <laughs> Harding. Uh, uh, young Tom. <laughs> yeah. To, to do all the work, I should yeah. say. <laughs> oh, that'd be interesting to see. I wonder if they would get uh, Jake Johnson to do the live action version of the Spider-Man that he did. I mean, he didn't really, he doesn't really resemble, he did the older Spider-Man, the one who kind of mentored, who got sucked into the first one. into the Spider-Verse. Into the Spider-Verse, yeah. So if they do a live Spider-Man into, isn't that what you're talking about? Like a live spider into the Spider-Verse, right? Yeah, yeah. But they're looking to do do, a live action version. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It'd it'd be interesting to see if Jake Johnson could pull something like that off. The cartoon version didn't really resemble him all that much, I don't think. No. But uh, so it'd be interesting to see if they would actually use him, if they would bring somebody. That's an interesting, that'd be an interesting one to try to bring into a live action. Yeah. Could they get Nicolas Cage to to do the, get Nicolas Cage to do the, uh, what's the version of (laughs) Spider-Man? Oh, Spider-Man Noir. (laughs) Yeah, the Noir Spider-Man that he was. That would be interesting. Might be, might be an interesting live action thing to do. Yeah, it would be cool. Hopefully that goes through. We don't know. It's everything's all speculation, (laughs) but. Uh, we have a couple of podcast recommendations. I'll let you talk about our first, the one I posted first. Oh, sure. As always, we, we love to recommend and they're on a, currently they're on a bit of a hiatus. So, but you can always listen to the back, the, the back podcast episodes of lost. We have to go back or it's actually lost revisited. We have to, we have to go back colon lost revisited podcast which is on uh, this network the next level and uh, the next level and podcastica joint effort between ben and Kristen. Uh, also strange indeed we've already talked a little bit about that with rima and currently sean is is taking a break so rima is podcasting with jason and uh, they are covering lock and key season one that's on podcastica again strange indeed and then of course the language of bromance with richard and sean which is on the bros bros network bros something network podcast bros podcast bros okay uh but it, just look it up language of bromance those guys have a lot of fun and uh they're pretty funny to listen to uh, a couple of youtube recommendations that we have since we have our podcast on youtube i would recommend popcorn planet a show by andy signor as well as his other show that he just developed which would be called hugging the cactus Andy, if you don't know, was a creator of Screen Junkies, Honest Trailers, and Movie Fights. They were great shows on YouTube, and I used to love watching them all the time (laughs) until he kind of disappeared. But there was a lot of controversy and rumor that was going on. 
But after that, in the aftermath and everything that happened with uh, Andy, he came back and much luck to him. And please show him some love and, you know, check out the YouTube channel that he has. Check out an episode. If you like it, subscribe, give him a thumbs up. If not, you know, at least give it a shot. And the next one would be the Grim Life Collective with Michael and Jessica. They've been uploading their videos from their journey to California recently. So they've been going to film locations within California of uh, movies that we love, kind of horror movies. Uh, I think they did Creature from the Black Lagoon at one point, too. Huh. And then uh, I mentioned before they did the Back to the Future, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. They've gone to, I think, they went to Bella Lugosi's uh, grave site, and they they visit a few things. So they're into that kind of thing. I love that kind of stuff, too. I like the spooky films, and especially like the Universal Monsters and stuff like that. They, Very cool. They went to Disneyland. They went to uh, to the uh, Star Wars, you know, exhibit that they have in Disneyland, and they had fun out there. They do a lot of video of that. So I, I recommend check them out, you know. If you liked them, give them a thumbs up on the video that you watched, or if not, subscribe and just keep following them because they are entertaining and they're really down to earth people. Very cool. So this podcast can be heard on Spotify, Google Play, Apple iTunes, or whatever podcast player of choice you choose to use. If they have a rating system available, please go in there and give us a five-star review or whatever would be a great review. We love to see those on any platform. You can also visit our website. It is panels to pixels podcast.com you can visit our facebook page which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels you can email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com that's panels to pixels one the to is spelled out right there in the middle with the number one at gmail.com you can also call us and leave us a voicemail at 845-350-2095 again that's 845-350 three five zero two zero nine five and please make sure to state that you're leaving voicemail for panels to pixels podcast when you leave your message you can also hear us on youtube as mark just talked about his youtube recommendations we are also post this podcast to youtube in fact i think it goes to youtube first and mm -hmm. it is just panels to pixels podcast on youtube awesome where else can listeners hear you mark well I'm a co-host on The Walking Dead Talk Through with Brian Malosh on Talk Through Media. We review The Walking Dead each week when Fear of the Walking Dead is on. We review that when it's out. And we'll be reviewing the new Walking Dead show spinoff once that comes into play as well. This show, Panels to Pixels, will stay on the Next Level Podcast Network, but there will always be a link for Talk Through Media for others to listen to as well on our Facebook page. So we'll post whatever, you know, like even the Cardcast, and I highly recommend that. That's something that Brian does. So if you're interested in the TV show Picard, check that out and listen to Brian and Ruthie on Talk Through Media. So you could get those podcasts for talk, you know, Walking Dead Talk Through through talkthroughmedia.com or whatever podcast player of choice you use. Exactly. Uh, it could be Apple iTunes, Google Play, yeah, Stitcher, Stitcher, and Spotify. There you go. Uh, I submit voicemail to various podcasts. I submit voicemail to the Picard cast. I submit voicemail to TV podcast industries, Picard cast, uh, and the aforementioned strange indeed. And, uh, so you can hear my voice on various TV podcasts. If you happen to be listening to. Them. Well, that seems to be our show for today. Seems to be. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, well, next episode of panels to pixels podcast, you'll, uh, we'll be reviewing. Season 3 of Daredevil, episodes 11 and 12. So if you have any information that you want, just go to our Facebook page, leave those comments, call us at that phone number, send an email. So with that, that was our show this evening, panelers. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on the next panel. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And good night. Talk to you later. Bye.